All right, before I start, two questions for the audience before the last talk of the day. All right, raise your hands if any of you have a, a smartphone or a portable game system. Pretty much everyone. I see a few people who must be asleep because I'm going to bet almost everyone here has one. Okay, how many of you have a talking robot at home? One? Okay. So in the next 14 and a half minutes, I'm going to convince you two things. One, that's going to change. In the next five years, you're all going to have robots at home. Two, I want to convince you, particularly for the youth in the room, that you should be a part of making this happen. Okay, so how am I going to do this? I'm going to tell you a few stories. I've spent the last 10 years working in interactive robots, social robots, actually, and I'll explain what that is in just a second. And I've done a bunch of studies, particularly from about 2001 to 2006. I want to tell you stories from two of those studies, talk about what we're doing right now, the new robot that's almost out, and I'll explain why one of them isn't here today. Sorry. And then I'll close with a little bit about what we think is going to happen in the future. What's a robot? A lot of different definitions of that. Right? We have sci-fi robots. I'll show some pictures of a couple of those at the end of the talk. Right? So something that might look like this. I mean, how do you know I'm not the robot here today? I'll let you decide at the end of the talk. Okay, a robot might be very simple, right? Something that moves around. I'm gonna talk first about this robot in the middle. This is simply a pair of eyes. They can look around, wink, blink. And I'll talk about some more complex robots in a minute. But I started off, this was uh, just over 10 years ago, I was working with this simple robot here. So what you can see on this slide is this simple robot in the middle, a 3D animated version to the right there, and some human eyes to the left. So we did a study looking at, okay, what's the difference when we interact with one of these versus another? So the reason I started off running this study was, at this time 10 years ago when I started working in this area, there had been a few interactive robots built. And we often use the term social robots, and the social part here means robots that understand something about human interaction. And usually that goes both directions, right? Understand something about what we do when we're conversing with someone. So, you know, where we're looking, whether we look away, if we look bored, if we look interested. And be able to do the opposite, right? So to be able to look at us, to be able to use the social cues that we use all the time in interaction. So those are the kind of robots that we were using. And there have been a few of them built uh, 15, 10 to 15 years ago. And it was clear that people were really engaged with some of these. There was something interesting happening, but we didn't quite know what was happening or why. So I set out to run a series of studies trying to understand that. And for these studies, we used a variety of different robots. Some were as simple as this one right here, so just a few motors in it. Some were very complex. So we used a, a robot called Leonardo. He was uh, over half a meter tall, furry creature, built with a Hollywood studio. This one had 70 motors in it. About half of those were in his face, so it was nearly as expressive as your face or mine. Now, what we found across all of these studies is that the results were very similar, and in particular, we focused on comparing people interacting with a robot versus a character on the screen. Now, why is this? One reason is we know a lot about what happens when we interact with characters on the screen. This has been a subject that's been studied a lot, human-computer interaction for the last 30, 40, 50 years. We've learned a lot about it. The other reason is what I've done for the last 15 years is work at the intersection of new technology and healthcare. And one trend that we've seen is a lot of healthcare is moving out of the hospital, out of the doctor's office, and into our homes. These days, onto our mobile devices, our phones, our tablets. And so, you know, I was really interested in what's happening there and comparing these. And what we found were two big differences. Two differences in the psychology of how we interact with these things. So one is the robot draws someone in more quickly. And part of that's novelty, right? I bring someone into a room, there's a talking robot sitting there. It's like, oh, cool, I get to talk to a robot. But the interesting part is after that novelty wears off, the engagement with the robot continues to last for much longer than the animated character. The other difference we see is we're trying to convey information to someone. And so we use textbook information, you know, math, science, geography lessons. We use health-related information. It didn't matter what the information was. When it was coming from the physical robot, it was seen as more credible and more informative. The character itself was seen as more credible and more trustworthy. So there's just these basic psychological differences we get when we're interacting with something that's physically there in front of us versus virtual. Now, these days, I'm running a company. I'm based here in Hong Kong. I've been here almost four years. A lot of my customers are in the US. So I spend a lot of time traveling back and forth. 
Why? Face-to-face -face meetings are important. Same reason that we're all gathered here in the same room. Right? We know the TED videos are all online. We saw one of them at the beginning of this session and earlier in the day. We could just sit at home behind a computer and watch them. But there's something different about meeting face-to-face -face with someone. And we'll continue to do this when we're done in this setting, talking face-to-face -face with each other. And what we see is those things carry over very strongly into technology. You know, Face-to-face -face interactions with someone else, we tend to trust that person more. We believe what they're saying. We're more engaged in listening to them versus doing the same thing over, say, a video conference or instant messenger or IM or email. There's a lot of different ways that we can communicate, but face-to-face -face is really different. And we see the same thing carrying over into technology, and that's what we see with the robots. So I want to give you one more example. So first, I wanted just a picture here. This is Leonardo, the big furry guy that I did a number of studies with a few years ago that I was just talking about. But I wanted to give you an example from Mel. This is robotic penguin right here on the left. Okay, Mel's a pretty simple robot. Uh, you can see he's got a couple of flippers out here, right, like a penguin would, and he can move them together up and down. His head can move left and right. He's got a beak there that's hard to see, and it can move in time with his talking. And then his eyes are actually sewn on doll eyes. Okay, really simple. They can't move at all. But one thing you can notice is there's a little uh, an old webcam. This was a, a study from eight years ago now. There's a webcam behind so we could look out and see where a person is. Now, the interaction that Mel did with people, I brought 40 people into a lab. And this was at a Japanese company, Mitsubishi Electric. And they had a bunch of different projects going on in this lab. So Mel was giving a demonstration of one of the other projects. We brought people in. And for about five minutes, Mel gave a demonstration of this other project. It was kind of this, uh, this glass and this pitcher that knew when it was empty. Uh, you know, the premise being you go to, go to a bar. And when your beer is empty, the bartender knows and can bring you another one. Uh, and so Mel gave this demonstration. And he worked in one of two ways. Okay, so for half of the people who came in, Mel worked kind of like I was just talking, right? He used that camera up above to see where the person is. You know, if I moved to the side to look at the other part of the demo, Mel would turn his head and keep looking at me. You know, if he was talking about something over there, he would flap his arm, right? Just like we might do if we're gesturing at something. It's a little bit different since he's a penguin. So for 20 of the 40 people, he did that. For the other 20 people, we made one simple change. We unplugged all the motors. <laughs> So Mel gave the demo, except the entire time he's standing there just like this, right? Never moving, looking straight ahead. Five minutes of that. Okay, so after five minutes, we brought each person out. And there was a whole series. I was doing a bunch of psychological questionnaires, doing an interview with people. But the first question I asked for everyone is, you know, did Mel make eye contact and look at you and move around while he was talking to you? All 40 people told me yes. Right, they just spent five minutes with this robot that was sitting there not looking at them, and they thought he was moving because he was interactive, because he was telling them about something. So no one could tell the difference as far as what was actually going on. But then we asked people a bunch of questions about you know, how much they liked the interaction, uh, how much they believed that uh, you know, what he was telling them was true about this demonstration, whether they'd want to come back and interact with him again. And there were some very big differences. So the fact that there's something physical there is not the only important thing. The fact that it can interact and have a conversation like you or I and be animated is actually extremely important as well. So what do we do from there? We've taken these ideas and a bunch of other studies that I don't have time to talk about today and put these into some healthcare applications. So what I've been working on for the last seven years now is taking these concepts of you know, the believability of conveying information from a robot, the engagement that we can have, the ease of use in talking to it. You know, with a robot like one of these right here, you know, even though there's really complex technology in here, there's nothing you have to learn to be able to interact with it. You know, a lot of people we brought in to interact with these had definitely never talked to a robot before. We've had people in some of our studies who never even own a computer. Yet they were able to, with no instruction whatsoever, have a conversation with one of these. So it's a big advantage of this kind of technology that there's no learning curve. It's very easy for anyone to use. And so the broad healthcare area that I've been working in for the last seven years is that of behavior change. So why? What is behavior change about? It's about convincing someone of something and then getting them to stick with it over time.
Now, the video that started the session was actually a great lead-in to this. And so Matt Cutts on there, and ironically, I was actually on the plane with him when he was on his way to give that talk, <laughs> was talking about making a change for 30 days. And he makes it sound pretty easy, so I encourage you to go out and try it, because it's actually really difficult. One thing we know about people in general is we're great at making changes and absolutely terrible at sticking with them. If we try to make a change, the average time it lasts tends to be around three and a half weeks, right? not even a month. So if we're trying to convince someone to do something, it requires some constant reinforcement, which is what I've been focused on for the last seven years. So this robot right here, her name is Autumn. So this robot is just about to go into production. We're going to start selling these at the end of this week. They'll start shipping early next year. So this is unfortunately why I don't have one with me today. We're going back and forth with our factory in mainland China getting these ready to go. But she's about uh, 27 or 28 centimeters tall, sits on a countertop, and she's kind of like having a personal coach or personal trainer at home. So she talks to someone every day about, uh, you know, in this case we're focused on weight loss, but about eating and exercise, asks me what I've eaten, how much I've exercised, gives me some feedback and advice so that she can help me stick with the goals that I've set for myself. And we've done a study with an earlier version of this, and what we found is it's extremely effective. Right? There are countless applications on iPhone or Android or other smartphones that will do essentially the same thing, help me keep track of my eating and exercise. And why does everyone try to do this? Because we know that you know, most people fail at diets. They last about three and a half weeks, like I was just saying, for any behavior change. But the few people who succeed are the ones who keep track of their eating, their exercise, and their weights. So that's what we try to do. Now, there's tons of smartphone apps out there, and the average time someone uses one is about a week. Now, it turns out the trial we did with the earlier version of this, one of the biggest challenges for me, this is when I was finishing my PhD, one of the biggest challenges in that trial was that people would not give the robots back at the end. So they really stuck with it. So we've seen this to be very successful. So I think this is the first example of a new kind of technology that we're going to see a lot of in the next few years. This is starting in a couple of places. In the last 10 years, we've seen a few other somewhat interactive robots. How many of you know the Roomba vacuum cleaner? And a few people in the room. So a little disc vacuum cleaner that moves around the room. Pretty simple, right? It's not really meant to be interactive, but. People definitely engage with their Roomba and watch it. You know, it's, the joke is it's supposed to be a time-saving device, but it doesn't actually save any time because everyone sits there and watches the Roomba clean the floor. How many of you know the Robo Sapien? It's a little walking robot about this tall. All right, we've got a few people there. So it's, uh, I don't know how tall that one is, maybe 35 centimeters, 40 centimeters. And it's a remote-controlled robot. So it's a really complex, like, 42-button remote control. And I can make it, you know, sort of walk around and move its hands, do a few other things. And this is where this kind of technology is starting in the marketplace, right? Single-purpose robots, like something that cleans, vacuums, mops, a few other things. And toys because we don't expect as much from them. But I think this is the example of the first kind of product that does something a lot more. Right? This has a conversation with me. And she's not following a script. She's coming up with something new to say each day as she learns more about me. And this is the kind of thing we're going to see a lot more of in the next few years. I think any time some new technology like this is introduced into the market, then we'll see a lot of other people doing similar things. And I know that there's a, n a number of other things that we'll see in the next year or two. All right, so here's the sci-fi robots I promised. All right, what do, we, what do we see happening here, right? You know, she's, she's hugging her robot. This is definitely something a little bit different than we would do with the RoboSapien or the Sony Ibo or the vacuum cleaner. But this is where we're going. Not necessarily about love, but about real interaction. Understanding, you know, what someone is doing, actually trying to accomplish something with someone. And that's why I'm interested in the healthcare aspects of this. But the cool thing is there's a lot of technology out there now. And it takes all kinds of people to put this together. I mean, the stuff that we do combines robotics, obviously, right? So a lot of engineering, computer science. Psychology is actually one of the most important parts of it and understanding the interaction. And so if you're interested in any of those areas, I think you should be a part of making the next generation of robots.
Thank you.